Where goes the market? Yeah, that is the question. Because at the moment, there are some contradictory, there are some contradictory signals. Like right here, right now, the oil market is, is in decent shape. It's not, not, far, off, not far off balanced. Uh, but if you look a little further into the future, into the first and the second quarter of next year, it looks increasingly likely that we will have to deal with quite considerable oversupply, at least if OPEC maintains its current uh, output. It is just the fact that we are going through a period of surprisingly strong non-OPEC growth. This really started in 2018, continued in 2019, but even in 2020, we'll have quite a bit of non-OPEC growth just, and demand is relatively soft. Um, yes, the demand side we must cover as well. So many things you've said already interest me. I've just come back from Adipec and I thought, and I've interviewed lots of amazing people out there, but I thought one of the themes was concern about shale, ironically, and concern about shale investment going forward and sustaining the growth rates uh, that we've seen over the last few years or so. Now, I know it's something that OPEC always hopes for, but there is a feeling that the spending on new infrastructure, on new shale, isn't happening as well. So does that problem about oversupply from non-OPEC just go away naturally over the next couple of years? It might go away naturally in 2021, 2022, but there are a couple of things to consider around, uh, around shale. If there is one group of companies that has shown this enormous tenacity and a resilience to do more with less over the yeah. last few years, it's been U.S. shale. Yeah. It's also the case that if you assume double TI at $55 a barrel, there is simply an awful lot of profitable shale drilling left to be done. And I guess the other point is it's not moms and pops anymore with their, I, I use the word mom, because he's thinking, what are you laughing at? You're laughing at something from my last question. <laughs> Nothing I I'm can not going any it. further until you answer it. <laughs> I can't say it on air. Okay, I will say, oh, I like that. Um, but it's not small operations anymore, it's big operations with one of the larger players taking larger and larger shale fields. Yeah, no, uh, this, is, uh, this is also very relevant. So normally what we do is we, you know, we look at the independents, the ind independent EMPs, uh, and what they say about you know, the balance sheets and their cash flows and costs and what have you, their drilling plans, and we extrapolate from there across all of US shale. But it's, it's, it's simply the case that in 2019, independent EMPs were just about a quarter of total US shale growth, because increasingly the majors do more, and the really small ones, admittedly small companies, but there's a long tail of them, they do more. So, so the companies that are most vocal about their plans are actually slowing the fastest and are creating the impression that the overall shale outlook is perhaps decelerating a bit faster than what we think is actually happening. Barney. Yeah, Martin, you, you probably cover the single most important commodity in the world. Uh, all central bank inflation expectations are probably pivoting off oil. I wonder how you guys do it, um, s distilling supply from demand, but to what extent would you say that the oil price here or the delta over the last two years has been about supply? So you, you touched upon this in your introductory comment. If you were to take away the supply constraint, where do you think just based on pure demand, oil should trade? Yeah, uh, frankly, we do it, but we do it with difficulty. This is not at all obvious. Um, it's, it's simply um, a matter of sort of practical reality that we have to deal with is that the supply statistics are relatively solid. We get them reported quite quickly and they're of decent quality. But the demand statistics are lagged, they're delayed, they're quite heavily revised. So this is, this is partly simply sort of um, putting all the data points that we have together and sort of trying to read uh, the tea leaves. I think um, if you look at the oil market in 2019, uh, softness in demand is definitely something that has been a major, major feature. Um, and in that sense, it explains a lot. Um, lately, uh, you are starting to see some better oil demand numbers coming through. Um, and some people are, are highlighting that as, as being part of a potential bull case. Um, but you really have to look at what products demand is, um, is growing. Refiners run to make diesel and gasoline. And if you focus on diesel and gasoline, that demand uptick is not there yet. Trade and manufacturing has continued to remain relatively weak. We're all hopeful that that rebounds, but the demand side has definitely been problematic this year. But, but you, you're basically saying that serious downside risks next year? Well, um, it, a lot depends on the OPEC meeting that is coming up on December the 5th and December the 6th. But if OPEC were to decide to sort of broadly maintain current levels of output, yeah, it is, it, 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 and you go through the numbers, you know, Norway's ramping up um, from 19 into 20, Brazil is ramping up from 19 into 20, later in the year we're going to get Guyana, demand is soft, yeah sure US shale is slowing down, but we would still argue that shale can add around about 800,000 barrels a day of growth next year, unless you start to believe in these very low shale numbers that some people are advocating for, but we are not, and then assume a big recovery in, in, in trade and manufacturing, maybe then you can come up with a, a better balance. 
But the, the way it currently looks to us is that the first half of, of next year looks problematic. Hi, I'm Joanna Bersecci and thank you for watching. You can check out more of our videos by clicking on the boxes on the screen. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more from CNBC International. Thank you for watching.